goes in and out and thinking about church and God. And, and man, y'all do it, so don't tell me you don't. Because you'll do anything to avoid coming to church most times. And it's not you, it's your friends, right? Because I know how we're wired. That we'll look for things to do. Well, I got it. I got it. I gotta take a dog to bed. Well, the best not open Sunday. Well, I gotta get you ready. <laughs> <laughs> you got church, I'm gonna keep the kids. So when do you when do guys when do we ever say that? <laughs> we never say that. Except on Sunday we would say that. <laughs> That's how we are. I don't I can't speak for you ladies, but that's how us guys you are. We'll we'll look for ways to avoid hearing God speak. Today, if you're one of those folks, the struggles with hearing the voice of God that I want to share with you today. So I'm in the same boat. I long to hear the voice of God, and I want to be in God's will, and I want to live there and function there on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and I believe the scripture today has a lot to tell us. Everything changes is the title today. I believe it is. Right, Blake? It wasn't there. Maybe it was. Maybe it wasn't. Uh, right on. <laughs> Everything changes. Uh, why did I say that? Because I believe that this is this is a transitional passage. This end of chapter 2 in the book of Exodus is a transitional passage for the book. We've seen so far that, that Moses' mom was compassionate, right? That she was, that, that she took action. She, she did something to save the boy's life, right? That, that Pharaoh's daughter, we saw her at work. We saw uh, Pharaoh at work. You know, I mean, he himself was kind of the impetus to all this going on. And he kind of forced the hands of everybody. <laughs> That, then we saw Moses, how he kind of jumped in and took action before it was time, but he jumped in there and started doing stuff. We saw Pharaoh's, I mean, not Pharaoh's, but Moses' father-in-law, we, we, we're going to learn in his name later is, uh, we, right now we know it as Raul, but later on it's going to be Jethro. Uh, but we understood that he like took action and, and how he was, he kind of played a part in all this. But for the first time today, we see that God is at work. As though he hasn't been all along, but today like he puts his, they put his name on Right? He's been there all along. But today we see that this is real. We find the first description, I believe, the character of God, something that we all long to develop in ourselves or see him develop in us, is the character of God at work in us. That's what we're going to look at today. Let's remember what's happened. Right? The, the Hebrew people left their promised land because of a famine. They moved to Egypt, and it was good. I mean, it was real good. So they hung around. I mean, the famine was going to last a few years, but they've been there for like 400 years. So they overstayed their welcome to some degree, and Pharaoh knew it, and he wanted to punish them. Right? They were going to overtake everything. So he wanted to keep his thumb on them. He wanted to push them back down. He would keep them in their place kind of thing. And so he began to really oppress them. They, everybody in Egypt was an indentured servant. I mean, everybody worked for Pharaoh. So they weren't slaves in the sense that we think of in our American history as slaves, but, but they were indentured servants. But what he did for the people from Hebrew, the Hebrew people was he, did, he increased their expectations. Like he expected more from them. He made it more difficult for them. So in that sense, he oppressed them as slaves. And that, that's the way. So that's where we find ourselves. In Exodus chapter 2, you brought your Bible, I just want to give you an amen. Praise the Lord. Bring your Bible. Exodus chapter 2, verse 23. We said, during that long period, all that has happened, over all these 400 years, and now after Moses ran away, he tried to fix it, he ran away, he's been a shepherd up in some other country, over another continent, actually, I guess, the king of Egypt died. The king of Egypt died. The Israelites broke in their slavery and cried out, their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. I mean, we can all imagine this, right? That, that, um, that we're, we're going through a hard time, we're going through a hard time. And finally, the one, the, the cause of our problems is removed. Or in this case, die. The king died. The one who was oppressing us died. Right? You know what it's like. You've been there before, right? When, when finally, things are going to be better. Right? The new knees. Everything is going to get better when I get these knees fixed. And then the rest of you notices that <laughs> it's time for our season to hurt. Right? Or, or it's a new job. That, that I'm going to get a new job, new boss, everything's going to happen. New teacher, like teacher gets sick and gets called out, so you're getting a new teacher and you're like, ha ha! No, this person, new was even worse than <laughs> Right? That everything like, gets, goes from bad to worse sometimes. Mm -hmm. Never experienced that? I know I have. That's what the Israelites, the Hebrew people were going through. They, it had been bad, and finally, the cause of all their problems, <laughs> finally, died. Finally, was removed. We're going to catch a break. 
we're finally going to catch a break. And what happens? No break. It just keeps right on going, even worse than what it was. And what did they do? I mean, that makes your cries even louder, right? <laughs> oh, my Lord. Like, literally, you would say something. Oh, my Lord. Like, like come on, really? <laughs> I mean, many of us have been praying that the Patriots wouldn't be here today. Playing the Super Bowl. Seriously, what? Oh, my Lord, again? <laughs> so, and that's, that's why I'm wearing a green shirt today, because... Um, yeah. <laughs> now, I'm not really a Philly fan. He might throw something Santa Paul to root for him. Uh, but today, uh, I won't root against him. How about that? Uh, anyway, I'm not going to talk about Super Bowl. For, for the Hebrew people, the, the see Pharaoh removed was, was going to be a blessing. It was going to be a blessing. But what's God doing here? While they're waiting, while they're suffering, while they're persevering, what is God up to? They don't, they don't know. God's, God seems silent. So cue for us, when <clears throat> God seems quiet, he's not. Just because he's not speaking doesn't mean he's not acting. And that's what we see here in this passage. We see, we see the character of God revealed in these next two verses in a way that kind of summarizes all of Scripture. In a way that four things that we see God doing, and I believe tell us a lot about what God is still doing because of his character, who God is answer to many of our prayers. Verse 24. God heard their groaning. He remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. The ministry of the people. God heard it. God hears. He absolutely hears our pain. Their pain. When we cry out because of the death of a loved one. Because of an illness. Because of financially. I just don't know how we're going to make it. He hears those cries. <coughs> Somebody famous, I can't remember who it was now, um, said that tears have a voice that God interprets. The tears have a voice that God interprets. That, that when we cry to God, when we just cry, we don't even have to cry to God. That he hears. And that's what the passage tells us, is that they weren't crying out to the Lord in prayer or anything like that. They were just crying out in pain. And he heard that. He heard it. It cuts through. Somehow, in a powerful way, and God remembers is the next thing. God heard it, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. Now, God doesn't forget. So it's not like God forgot. Like, oh yeah, <laughs> the Hebrew people. Like, oh, I wonder where I put them. Like, not like the keys or anything. Not like that kind of remember. It's actually that from their perspective, like, man, God remembers this. Like from them looking at God, they're like, God remembers us. When all along he had remembered. Right? That's the thing throughout Scripture. Is that regardless of what his people do, he remembers his covenant. He's faithful to his covenant, to his promises. He's always faithful. Always. Not just with Moses. Not just with Adam and Eve. Think of, of, of how they were created. And how they were blessed. And how he's faithful to them, even in their sin. Think of Joseph. Think of King David. King David, for, for all people who, who uh, could, I mean, stole a man's life and then had him murdered, and yet Scripture would refer to him as a man after God's own heart. Like, what? He was faithful to David. Even though David was not faithful. God kept his promises. He remembers, in that sense, that he remembers it. That he made a promise and, and it's going to be kept. Because that's who God is. The promise was made in Genesis chapter 12. The Lord said to Abram, leave your country, your people, your father's household, and go to the land I'll show you, and I'll make you into a great nation. I'll bless you. I'll make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I'll curse. All the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. All the people will be blessed through you. This is common throughout Scripture, that God remembers His promises. That's something we hang on to something we can always hang on to. Verse 25. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. God looked and God cared, you might say. The two things going on in this verse. God sees. So the Hebrew word for that is uh, ra. Uh, not much significance in it other than the fact that, that it's not just seeing. It's actually 
understanding. It's actually sharing in. It's, it's like such a deep knowing or seeing that it's, it's really understanding. It's, it's not, it doesn't mean going through it with you, but, but he really, he knows it better than you do. He knows your cries. He knows the cries of everyone. Even though the Hebrew people wouldn't be considered righteous in the stories, I mean, they were just living life, trying to survive. They weren't, they weren't being lifted up for their righteousness, for all their, their holiness. No, not at all. But he heard them. He heard them. Scripture's pretty clear that he hears the cries of people in pain. In pain. Why? Because he cares for his creation. Psalm 34, 15, I guess. God, no, I don't want to do that. I'm going to skip that. But I will say, Psalm 145, verses 8 and 9, The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all He has made. On all He has made, God has compassion. Doesn't matter how good a person you are. Doesn't matter how awful your neighbor is. When they're in pain, God knows. God understands. He hears. He sees them. It's not about being good enough that God will understand where you because we've all been there, right? Where we say, oh Lord, if you only, if Lord, please. <clears throat> and we thought, but I, I love Jesus. Why am I having to go through this? Right? I mean, I've thought that for sure. What have I done? It's like, it's like God, if you only know what I'm going through, and you do something. No, he knows. He knows. It's not if he only knew. He does know. More than that. More than just knows. The word in Hebrew is yada. You, you know, it's the word we use all the time. Yada, yada, yada. You know. uh, no, I know, I know. You use it, I use it. So it's kind of a phrase we use. But it's, it's more than just I know, I know, I know, whatever. Go on, move on, next. It's more than that I know, I know, I know. Yada is more of I, I experience it. It's an intimacy. It communicates a, a closeness, a nearness with God that, that He's going through it with. He <clears throat> understands their pain. He knows their pain. He's experiencing their pain as part of them. He knows what they're going through. It's paining him too. It hurts him too when we are. Like he really understands it. Really understands it. He enters into our pain. That's what we did in Christ. He entered into our pain. To become one of us, to save all of us. <coughs> so far in this story, there's been a story of compassion. That God knows and God cares, and God is in, interested in what we're going through. The story of compassion, we saw it with, with Pharaoh's mom wanting to save her baby, right? That's completely logical. We saw it, compassion in the work of Pharaoh's daughter when, when she wanted to save the baby out of the river, right? We saw it in Moses when he went out and saw the way. Why are you trying to why you beat up that guy? He had compassion on him. So in Jethro, we're like, his father-in-law, we read it last week, and he's like, hey, girls, why don't y'all bring him back? <clears throat> like, bring him back and let's take care of him. Let's help him out. Compassion. And here we see it in God. God himself, the character of God is compassion. Compassion for those who are suffering. Deuteronomy 26, 7. Then we cried, this is Moses told the story in the book of Deuteronomy. Then we cried out to the Lord, the God of our fathers, and the Lord heard our voice, saw our misery, toil, and oppression. God heard it. God saw it. This tells us a lot about God's character. It tells us who God is, who, he's, who He is throughout Scripture, and who He remains to be today. He heard the cries of the suffering, and He responded. But so what? So what? I mean, it's good to know that God is faithful. It's good to know that God is a compassionate God. I mean, that is something we can rest in and, and, and gives us a, a sense of peace, that God cares. But so what? What, what do we do with it? Well, my, the way I take this um, is that we were created in God's image. You and I were created in the image of God, Scripture tells us. That, that male and female, He created to be a re representation. Scripture doesn't say that. That's what, the way I understand that word is that we were to be a representation of God to creation. We're to be his representatives. We're to represent him. In 
essence. To represent him to the world. And, and it's not like we can fake it. I mean, we, we can try. You know what I'm talking about? Like, like when you try to be nice to somebody that you really don't like. Like, you know, I'm around, I'm around to do this. I'm like, I gotta be nice to him. I gotta be nice to her, so I'm just gonna do it. You've been there, right? And they find every way in the world to step on your last nerve. Right? I mean, they had like every little thing, like such, I'm like, like oh, goodness, I'm oh. <laughs> or maybe it's just me, or maybe it's just me. <laughs> but we've been there, right, where we try to, like, we're trying, we're trying, we're trying to be nice, we're trying. It's because we're trying to fake it. We're faking it. We don't really mean it. We're God. It was never a burden to him. Our cries were never a burden to him. To him, it became natural. Came natural because it was who he was. He didn't have to fake it. God was being himself. And our cries are not a burden. Being good to us, being blessing us is not a burden. Not a burden at all. And we've, we've heard the story, we've heard the song maybe, or two or several, about being the hands and feet of Christ. I want to ask this. What's the significance of being the hands and feet of Christ? We don't hear what he hears. I mean, it's important to be hands and feet, the hands and feet of Christ. But if we don't hear the call that God is calling or, or hear the, the cry of those in need, we just become a statue. And hands and feet of Christ. The reality is, you see, that the nearer we get, the clearer we hear to God. The nearer we get to God, the clearer we hear his voice. The nearer we get to our neighbor, those in pain, those hurting, the clearer we hear their cries. The nearer we get, the clearer we hear. It's like practicing that song. The more we sing it, the more we just know how it sounds, right? The more time we spend in it, with it, the more we know what it's thinking. And this is a I believe this, this points us to a passage in the New Testament where Jesus was teaching the character of God revealed in the world when he said this, Wow, it's small again. I don't know what I'm going to do, brother. <clears throat> then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer, Lord, when do we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When do we see you a stranger and invite you in, or need you clothes and clothe you? When do we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, I'll tell you the truth, whatever you did for the least of one of these, my brothers, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed. Enter into the, fire, the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Depart from him, the king says. You, you, you missed it. I don't know you. <clears throat> Depart from him. I know that, um, oh, here's a fine opportunity. <clears throat> Kairos is a uh, ministry much like the Walter Bayes, which many of you have participated in. But Kairos is, a, is an, an organization that goes into prisons and does the of spiritual retreats in prisons for men and women uh, who are weak. <clears throat> They're coming to Delaware. They, they've been given they've been given permission to go into every prison in the state of Delaware uh, and offer these weekends to prisoners, inmates, uh, residents, as we call them, in the ministry that uh, have a spiritual retreat. It's a time for spiritual renewal. <clears throat> Great opportunity for for someone who's been on the walk to a mask, but kind of lost that, whatever you know, and hadn't been able to get connected. Here's an organization that says. Hey, we need about 100 volunteers. 100. There's a place. Jump in. Right? It's a great, fantastic organization. But, but you may not hear that cry, like this passage talks about the cry of the prisoner. You may not hear that. You may, you may not, like, be aware that you know, people in prison who are Christians. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, they are. They are. Yeah. And even if they weren't Christians, their cries got here. I stand up here every week and, and talk to you about things that, that where I hear God's cry. Youth ministry. 
the tutoring, the whatever it is, where, where I sense God calling me, He calling us. Maybe you don't hear that. Maybe you do. Maybe you hear God, maybe you hear people crying somewhere else. Great. Fantastic. Maybe you don't hear God. Maybe you don't hear the cry at all. It's not unique. I don't think I think a lot of times we just don't listen to it. <clears throat> At our small group on Tuesday night, uh, somebody came, uh, Dave Olson Jr. was uh, was there. He was, <laughs> was he junior, second, fourth, I don't know. I never asked. <laughs> uh, but he was sharing a story about uh, his work uh, as a firefighter in Baltimore, and, and he would share about it over the last several months that he's begun to see his work different. Um, differently, when he goes to work now, it's, it comes, goes with a different perspective, in a way of looking at things. And he said, you know, months ago, he was just, the place he's been, the things he's seen, he was kind of callous to it. Like when people would be going through it, he would just kind of do his job and get on the truck and go back to work, right? I mean, it was kind of, that was just what we do after a time, right? We kind of get numb to all of them, all the cries. They kind of get overwhelming, maybe. And then we just kind of tune them all out, right? And he was just sharing that, that over the last several weeks and months, how he's begun to spend time with God and, and read scriptures. He's talking about how he reads the Bible at work. And it's not something a lot of firefighters do, I don't think, to read the Bible at the station. But, but that's what Dave's doing. And, and uh, just trying to be faithful and, and trying to get to know God. And while he's doing that, uh, they got called up in that. Um, and he was sharing, I don't know if it was, last week or so anyway. Uh, cardiac, it was cardiac, and you can ask him, he can give you the right details, I might even know all this stuff, but this is basically the story. But then there was a cardiac arrest, and so they go out uh, to respond, and there's an older lady, uh, her husband is, I believe, was doing CPR, and he went in, and it was obvious that she was gone, you know, and so he had to tell her husband, you know, do all that, and uh, he said when he told us, when he went back out to where the husband was, and he, when he told her that, you know, told him and, and your wife was gone. He said, man, you know, they just fell apart, as we would expect, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> normally, they, he said that normally I would have just like <sighs> sighed and gone back and cleaned up, packed up my gear and got back on the truck and waited for whoever had to come and then we would have left. He said, but this time, this time, I, I'm really. I heard it. I spent an hour there praying and listening to this man talking about stories about his wife. He said, I've never done that before. I said, well, and, that's, and he knew why. It's because he was starting to hear God speak. He was starting to hear the cry of people that he'd been around forever. That finally, he was starting to lock in on. The blessing that God was, I, I asked him to share the story today to get work, but but it's because he heard the cry. <laughs> he heard the cry. There's a church uh, up in Cincinnati. I don't know if you've heard about the uh, the first African-American bishop, uh, lady, female bishop, in the Methodist church. Her name's uh, Leontine Kelly. She grew up the daughter of a, her father was a Methodist pastor, and he was appointed to uh, one of the, the Calvary United Methodist Church in Cincinnati, Ohio. It's, it's like one of those great big, huge downtown churches, you know, with Gothic, and I think I have a picture of it. Yeah. Uh, so that's the inside of it. A big, beautiful church. Very big, beautiful thing, you know. It's a church of presidents. You know, that everybody, if you were anybody in Cincinnati, Ohio, you went to that church. It was, it was like that kind of place, you know. Um, community around it changed. Church, had, you know, the, the makeup of the people who came to the church changed. It, we went from an all-white church to an all-African-American church. And it, he was the first African-American pastor appointed there. And I guess this was, this was back in... Uh, 30s, 40s, back in that time frame period. So anyway, the kids, uh, and she was the, the daughter of, she had three other brothers, I believe, and, and they were they finally had better rooms for themselves. They said this the parsonage was even fancier than the church. They said it was like unbelievable. All rooms all over the place and had a big great big basement cellar. And they would go down, the boys would go down and play in the basement cellar. And she was always scared of it because it was kind of creepy and cobwebs and you know, just a mess. And so uh, as Eventually, her brothers convinced her to come down and play down there. And so they did. They're exploring in the basement, and, and they find uh, behind the, the, the furnace, they find a hole in the wall. <clears throat> and they're like, Dad, you gotta, you know, they go up and get their dad. You gotta come see 
see this? In the hole in the wall. And he's like, okay. So he goes down. He checks it out. And he says, huh. Let's go over to the church. And he goes over to the church. And they, they go down the basement of the cellar in the church. And sure enough, they, they, they go behind the furnace. There's all, it's all boarded up behind the furnace. And uh, they pull all the boards off. There's a hole behind the furnace in the church. And he says, kids, I think y'all found something. They're like, what are you talking about, Dad? So they go home and have dinner and the dinner table at night. He tells them a story about the Underground Road and how that church, I mean, there were tunnels connected that church to other buildings right in downtown Cincinnati that they just moved into. They didn't, they didn't know nothing about it. The church didn't even really know anything about it. The fact of the matter is that that church heard the cry of people longing for freedom, longing to be held safe, Long to make it, like that, you would look at that and you would never think of these people had a heart for anything other than fancy. Right? And that, that's kind of what we, we make obstacles, we just make assessments of people don't care about that. And yet, they did. And yet, they did. The, the amazing thing of the church comes together, does some, accomplish something amazing. Amazing, because they, maybe they all didn't hear the same cry, but enough of them heard it, that it made a difference, that it made a difference. I don't know what cry you hear, maybe you just need to listen for the cry. Maybe you need to listen to somebody who's close enough to our neighbor already to hear their cry already. Like, some of you already know it. And we just need to listen to you. We just need to listen to you. How do we, I mean, as we think about our community, and I've been thinking about it a good bit, obviously, does, is our community crying out for Sunday morning worship? They should. <laughs> do they? I don't, I don't think so. Are they crying out for a Bible study? I don't think so. They cry out for a fish rod. I don't think so. <laughs> and that may be our cry. Maybe something we care about. But is it something they care about? I think, I, I really do think we need to get closer to them. To hear the cry. Because we're not like, we're not like God who's got a, a divine connection to each one of us in this room. We're not connected like that. Like, I need. Like, you don't know what they're saying down at Rock Hall Church right now? Why? Because you're not there. We have to be present in order to hear the cry. We're not like God. But we're created to have the character of God. That when we do hear it, we step into it. We step into it. So I'm going to pray for you this week. One, that you hear the cry that's around you, wherever you are. But maybe you move yourself closer to where the cry is so you can hear it clearly. So the nearer we get, the clearer we hear. I'm also going to be praying for you this week that you'd be filled with God's Holy Spirit power. That he would speak to you more clearly this week. That he would stir you to be closer to him, into his word, becoming intimate with him. That you would hear what he hears. And you would, he would know you, and you would know him fully. I'm going to pray for you. We're going to share a whole time today. Um, let's pray. Before we share this, holy man. Lord God, we love you. We thank you, Lord, that you have created us, God. You have you've called us, you've given us the ability to, to hear. God, that when we hear our neighbor, when we hear the cries, hear this community, Lord, that everything changes. Lead us, Lord. As we lift up today in worship, God, those we know and love and need to experience your grace just as we do. Father, I ask now that you'd speak to us. Hear us, Lord, as we pray and lift up the names of those we know and love and need to sense your presence today as well. Hear us.
hearing our prayers, for knowing our hearts. Lord God, for knowing the hearts of those who are far from you. Lord, continue to spur us, to move us, to, to irritate us.